Welcome, Irving Church, uh, and all who are joining us online. We're glad you're here today, glad to be able to worship together. I want to begin this morning by just saying a public word of thanks to the people who have helped us out over the last two to three months since we've been recording so much online, to our tech team, Michael Fancher, who's in the house today, and Terry Keel. Of course, Josh has done so much work with our Gather Online throughout the week, and others have helped us out. Cash, Maritza, uh, thank you guys for all that you've done. Your service has been so important recently. Let me just uh, remind you that you can still join us with our Gather Online throughout the week. Also, uh, you can contribute financially here, which is so helpful if you will get on Easy Tide. That's an easy way to do it. And the elders wanted me to mention that if you have not given recently online, then your live streaming, ser live streaming service is going to be cut off. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. That's not going to happen. But we do appreciate it when you're able to give. Uh, if there are any needs that you have, please don't hesitate to let one of us know. Uh, you're welcome to contact me. You may not have my number or email address. Contact somebody else. Contact one of the elders or someone you know here. We don't want people to fall through the cracks or you to be lonely, needing to talk to somebody, you to be, have financial or, or other needs. Uh, let us know so we can help you. Let us know if we can pray for you. And let us be here together as the body of Christ. Now, I don't have any other big announcements to make today. So uh, let me just welcome you, invite you to to welcome the Lord Jesus to be present with you right where you are today as you join in singing and praying and hearing the word together. All right. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. You are the light to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. You are the light to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. You are the light to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. 
You are the only truth and the way. You are the light to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings, yeah you were, yeah you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things, angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever, glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. So let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. For you and for your glory, take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. We sing glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. We sing glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Jesus Christ, he died for me, and he took away my sin. I will live with him for eternity. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. I want to invite you all to pray with us this time. Uh, I'm going to read some prayers to us. And the point of these prayers is, is not just so you can hear me reading prayers, but so that we can actually be lifting our hearts together to God. So let me invite you to join deeply in these prayers we're going to pray. I'm going to lead a prayer of confession and of intercession and of thanksgiving. And uh, at each point, I'm going to pause. But you feel free to reach up and pause your screen and, and stop, stop the recording for a moment if you want to pray longer here by yourself or with the people who are present with you. All right, let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. 
by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Father. If you, O oh Lord, kept a record of sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is plentiful redemption. All right, now we thank you for your mercy, Father. Let's offer thanks together now. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for the loving care that surrounds us on every side. We thank you for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit that we may know Christ and make him known and through him at all times and in all places may give thanks to you in all things. We give you thanks right now, Father. Let's have a prayer of intercession. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon the earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away 
Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. We pause now, and Lord, we lift up to you the concerns of our hearts. The burdens we bear personally, we bring them before you. You are our help. For the sick and the vulnerable at this time of crisis, we pray for your protection and for your health. For those who are lonely and discouraged, we pray for your divine encouragement. For those who are grieving and hurting deeply, we pray for you to meet them with the comfort of your Holy Spirit. For all of us, Lord, we ask for your gracious presence to be with us, to be real to us, and for your name to be glorified in and through us. And we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Good morning, Irving Church. Uh, welcome back to uh, our online Sunday services. Um, I'm going to be honest, I get a little, just it's, it's difficult to get in the groove whenever you're preaching uh, just to a camera. Uh, and so I figured I'd open up with a little joke. Um, so here goes. My buddy sent this to me yesterday. Let's see how you like it. Somebody once asked me, did they have any guns in the Bible? And I replied, yes, Paul had a pistol. A pistol. A pistol? E-P-I-S-T-L-E. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just assume that uh, everyone is laughing very hard right now. Michael is not laughing very hard right now. Um, so maybe that didn't go over so well. But uh, there we go. Uh, that's my joke for you this morning to get us started. Uh, today we are getting, uh, we're going on with our Life After Easter series. We started uh, at the beginning after Jesus had risen from the dead and uh, the disciples went back out fishing and Jesus called them uh, back into uh, following him and reinstating them. Uh, after that, Luke has been preaching to us a couple of weeks about the ascension where Jesus rose uh, back up into heaven and uh, how we've been given a new king and a new mission. Today, uh, I'm going to be talking actually in the same passage that Luke has been in the couple, past couple weeks, but just with a little bit of a different emphasis because there's so much there. And this week is going to be really, um, if we're being honest, it's just going to be teeing up uh, the t-ball plate, the t-ball thing for Terry uh, next week when he talks about Pentecost. So if you go with me to Acts chapter 1, that's where we're going to be today. In Acts chapter 1, uh, we're with the disciples again where Jesus is appearing to them. And it says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This seems a little odd, honestly. Uh, Jesus has risen from the dead, and everything that uh, has been said about him, everything that he said would happen, all the prophecy, prophecies that he would made that he was going to raise from the dead, that he was the Son of God, uh, have been validated. He's alive. He is the Son of God. He is the real king. And 
you would think, you know, the mission that he gave the disciples early on of going out and telling the world about this new kingdom, this new Messiah, it would be more time to share than ever. But instead, Jesus shows up and he says, ready, set, wait. It seems a little odd. Why? Why would they have to wait? Why would they, uh, knowing all this amazing stuff that Jesus is alive, they've seen him for themselves, and Jesus tells them, wait, why? We're going to get into that today. Uh, But before we move any further, I'd just like to stop and pray and uh, ask for the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share um, what could potentially be just a life-changing message, God. Um, I feel inadequate to be sharing about such um, amazing, amazing things from your word today. And so I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would just come. I pray that you would fill me. I pray that you would help me. Um, I pray, Jesus, that you would also be with all the rest of us who are listening to this sermon right now, that you would be with them and that you would open their hearts and their minds to be able to receive, uh, God, this this amazing word um, from your scriptures. So Jesus, I love you. I pray, come, help me now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jesus tells the disciples, wait. Why wait? Well, it's obvious if you were listening to the verse, he's saying, uh, you need to wait. Don't go anywhere. He says, wait for the gift my father promised. What is the gift that the father promised? Well, if you read back in John chapter 14 through 16, he talks about a helper who is to come. That is the promised Holy Spirit who is going to come and be with the disciples after Jesus leaves. And so when Jesus is about to leave right now, he's saying, hey, that Holy Spirit, the one that I promised you, he's coming. And he says, you need to wait for him before you go. And so, um, yeah, it goes down and he says, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. Now, this is what I want to know. If they, ha- they have some pretty good ammunition already, they can go out and say, truthfully, hey, y'all, we've seen the risen Jesus. We've seen Jesus uh, risen from the dead. And so have, uh, as Paul will say, about 500 other people during this time saw Jesus risen from the dead. And so they even had other witnesses, people to, uh, who could corroborate their story about Jesus being risen from the dead. And it makes me wonder, wouldn't that be enough just to like at least get started? Wouldn't this be enough for them to be like, well, I mean, like, the Holy Spirit's going to be pretty helpful, but, I mean, I feel like we could do pretty good right now just with what we got. Why not get a little bit of a head start? Well, that shows, I believe, just how important the Holy Spirit is. You see, many people, many Christians, um, might have that same mentality of why wait for the Holy Spirit? What is so important about him? What is so essential about him that we absolutely need him to accomplish our task? You see, many people, for many people, the Holy Spirit is, he's honestly not much more than just a part of our doctrinal statement. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity? Do you believe that he indwells believers? Yeah? Good, you can be a part of our club. Or he's like some kind of lucky charm. We know that we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us. Uh, and so we, we take him around with us wherever we go, but we're not entirely sure what he does. My goal today with this sermon is that we would see that the Holy Spirit is so much more than just a piece of a doctrinal statement or some truth that we affirm or some lucky charm that we carry around us. He's everything. This might seem like a weird place to start uh, in, a whole, in, a, uh, in a sermon about the Holy Spirit, but just track with me for just a second. I'm, I'm hoping it'll make sense, and uh, we will I'll hopefully be able to explain it well here towards the end. Uh, go to Joshua chapter 24, if you have your Bibles with you. Um, <clears throat> Joshua chapter 24, we're, we're at the end of the conquest of Canaan. Joshua has taken the Israelites through Canaan, and they've conquered pretty much all of it. And Joshua says, hey, you guys got it from here. Uh, but before he leaves them, he gives this farewell address. And he starts off really strong. 
Here's what he says in uh, verse 14. He says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And here's the refrigerator magnet verse right here. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua's doing pretty well right here. This is pretty motivating stuff. And you can tell by the response of the people. This is what they say. This is their response to Jesus when he tells them to follow the Lord. He, they say, the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us up and our parents out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We, too, will serve the Lord because he is our God. Now, if you're like a motivational speaker, mission accomplished. Hey, serve the Lord. And the people go, we will serve the Lord. You're done at that point. You can leave. You can you can go home. You've, you've accomplished your mission. The people, you have persuaded them. This has been a very persuasive speech. But Joshua is not a good motivational speaker, apparently. Because if you go into verse 19, this is the next thing he says. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. What? He says, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. What? Now, and this is not one of those things that I do. Sometimes I do this, where I read the scripture wrongly in order to, like, be dramatic and emphasize, you know, the right way to read the scripture. But this is not one of those times. This is actually what this says. Joshua says, serve the Lord. They say, we will serve the Lord. And then he says, you're not able to serve the Lord. And he even says, he will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. Whoa, that's weird. That is, that's, that's, that's not what we would expect right here. So what's the problem? Why can they, not, can they not serve God? And let's just bring this home just for a second. I don't know about you, but I've, I've felt that way a little bit myself sometimes. And I think we've all been there as well. I fe- there are times where you feel like, I can't serve God. God has asked this of me, and it seems like too much. Being a Christian is hard. In fact, I think it's too hard. I don't think I can do it. And if, we, if we're honest, we go back and we look, who was right? Joshua saying, you can't serve the Lord, or the Israelites who said, yes, we can serve the Lord. If we go back and read the rest of this Old Testament, I think we're going to go back and we're going to find that the Israelites were wrong, and Joshua was right. They were not able to serve the Lord. And the crazy thing is, they were given every opportunity God sent them prophets who performed many miracles and mighty signs and and things like that to bring Israel back to them whenever they strayed, to give them another chance. He gave them amazing kings like King David and King Solomon who led the nation into prosperity. But even then with those amazing kings, they still couldn't figure it out. They still, if we look at the broad picture, were largely unable to serve the Lord. What was the problem? What was wrong with them? Why? How were they unable to serve the Lord? Well, that's kind of the, the question that I want to answer today. Let's go back to Acts chapter 1. Jesus told them to wait. And the reason that he told them to wait, I propose, is that the, the task that the apostles had was too great for the powers that they had. Their task was greater than their powers to fulfill that task. And if you look in verse 8, this is the task that Jesus had for them. 
and Luke talked about this a little bit last week. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This is what you're going to do with it. He said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's a pretty big task. He said, you are going to go basically, essentially, literally, change the world. You're not going to just go to Jerusalem. You're not just going to Judea and Samaria. You are going to go and be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. This is a huge task. And this, I propose, is why Jesus told them, wait. Wait. Stay where you are because the task is too great for your power. You are not yet ready to go change the world by yourself. This is something that you are going to need greater power for. But thankfully, God gives them the power that they're going to need. He says, hey, I'm going to meet your need. I'm going to give you what you need to fulfill this big task. Now, just stop for just a second and imagine if you were in their shoes. And God's saying, hey, I'm going to give you what you need to accomplish this task of changing literally the whole world. What do you think that God was going to give after he said that? I would think that maybe God's going to, okay, I'm going to change the world. Might need an army. Maybe at least a billion dollars. Maybe, or at least like a, a strategic five-year plan of how we're going to do this. But God doesn't give them any of those things. God's answer to their enormous task is the Holy Spirit. He says, this is what you're going to need. I got right here, I got what you need to fulfill this enormous task, and that is the Holy Spirit. You see, God's mission requires God's power to fulfill it. And it wasn't a five-year plan, it wasn't an army, it wasn't a billion dollars, it was his spirit that the disciples needed. See, I've been, here, here comes the superhero reference, okay? Um, I'm going to step to the side right here so Michael can put these pictures in. Uh, I just want to do an example real quick of these superheroes. Uh, you watch these movies, and they're really awesome because in all of these great movies, there is, you know, in the plot, there has to be some big conflict. There has to be this big problem, this big task that has to be accomplished in order for it to be an entertaining movie. And you have these superheroes in these movies who all have something that is going to help them accomplish this huge task. You see, we got Iron Man right here. Iron Man is just a dude until he puts on the suit. He has this Iron Man suit that uh, helps him fly around and go pew pew and uh, fight the bad guys and it protects him and he needs his suit to do anything. Then you got Captain America. He was just a little, a little dude, a little scrawny guy. And then he gets this super soldier serum that they inject him with, and he becomes big and strong. He becomes Captain America. And even then, he needs a little bit more. He needs, you know, his shield. He doesn't go anywhere without his shield. And hold on, I'm just going to pause right here. Uh, any Marvel movie or comic book nerds are going to be finding loopholes everywhere in the things that I'm saying right now. So uh, give me a little bit of grace. It's just a sermon illustration. Then you got Yoda. You got the Jedis. They got the Force, and they got their lightsabers. You got Bilbo and Frodo. Baggins, they got their uh, their ring, and if you watch these movies, you know that they cannot accomplish their mission. They can't accomplish these tasks without their secret weapon. Maybe they can do a couple of things, you know, on their own, and it shows that you know they're a big hero and stuff, and they don't need the thing. But we all know that they really do need the thing. They really do need their secret weapon to complete these tasks to beat the bad guys, and we would all say. If they're going to go out and try to save the world, if they're going to go try and take down Thanos, if they're going to go try and find the dwarves' dungeon and get them their treasure back and their home back and all that stuff in these movies, take down Darth Vader, they need their secret weapon. They need the Force. They need their lightsaber. They need their Iron Man suit. They need their shield, whatever it is, fill in the blank. They can't do it without their secret weapon. And the same is happening right here with Jesus. He's telling the disciples, you cannot do this without your secret weapon. And your secret weapon is the Holy Spirit. Don't leave without him. It's not worth it. You will fail without him. And we see this. We see this to be the truth. Look at the lives of the disciples before they received the Holy Spirit here at Pentecost. 
They were a bunch of bumbling dudes who can never figure out their stuff. Jesus gave them a little bit of power, and they were able to do some awesome things for a little bit, cast out some demons. They shared the gospel a little bit. But still, as a whole, they really can't get their stuff together. We see that they are unable to cast out demons. We see that they are unable to keep their promises to Jesus. And they're still prideful, arrogant dudes. They sit around and argue about who's the best. They just can't seem to get their stuff together. But then, Pentecost happens. And you don't see this anymore. These guys, as a majority, as a general rule, they have figured something out. More than that, they haven't really figured something out. They've received something. Something has changed inside of them. We look and we see that they're doing all these amazing things and what's and they're, they're casting out demons and they're, they're fearlessly taking on the religious leaders that just a few weeks ago before they were hiding from. What changed? If you go back and look, there's this little phrase that shows up so many times in the book of Acts before or after somebody does something amazing and it says things like, and then Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, got up and addressed the rulers and the elders. Or Stephen, as he's getting ready to be martyred, as he's boldly standing up and proclaiming the name of Jesus in front of people who want to kill him, it says, and then Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up and saw Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. And then it says that full of the Holy Spirit, they began to speak the word of God boldly. The common denominator isn't that, as great as that was, it wasn't even that they saw Jesus risen from the dead. It was the fact that they were full of, of the Holy Spirit. That is what changed them. They had become equipped. They now had their secret weapon. They had everything they need to complete their impossible task of bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. And now I'm going to try to take us back to Joshua now and try to put that together if you're still a little confused about why we brought that up. The thing about Joshua, that passage in Joshua, he says to them, you're not able to serve the Lord. And I kind of passed over the why. But this is what he says. He says, you are not able to serve the Lord. Why? He is a holy God. And Joshua doesn't really say anything about the Israelites here, but the implication is, is he's saying, he is a holy God, and their problem, the reason that they could not follow him, the reason that they failed over and over and over again, is because He was a holy God, and they were not a holy people. And you see, this is the beauty about the New Testament. This is the beauty about Jesus ascending into heaven and sending his Holy Spirit to us, is that he has given us the answer. He has given us what we need to fulfill the mission and the mission to follow him. The Israelites could not follow a holy God because they did not have a holy spirit. But now, as New Testament believers who believe in Jesus, you have been given the Holy Spirit. And the book of Hebrews says that we've been cleansed so that we may now serve the living God. This is huge. The Holy Spirit is the missing piece of the puzzle. This is why I get a little irritated sometimes why people compare themselves so much to Israel. We see the passages about Israel uh, you know, turning on God, and right after they get out of out of Egypt, they make a golden calf, and they complain about manna, and they turn from God, and they serve idols, and all that stuff, and, you know, people are like, well, don't get too mad at them. You know, we're just like Israel. You're not just like Israel. You were maybe just like Israel, but now you have something that Israel never had. You have God's own spirit living inside of you, enabling you to worship him, enabling you to be a godly person, enabling you to fulfill the mission that God has put on your life. And it's a beautiful thing. And some people will point to Romans chapter 7. And some people will say, well, what about Paul? Paul struggled. Paul went through it. Paul felt like he couldn't really follow God. And they point to uh, these verses in chapter 7 where he says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. 
And we see this passage and we go, look, the Apostle Paul, he tried to follow God, he tried to do the right thing, but he couldn't do it either. Well, maybe I'll admit for a second that, yeah, maybe Paul did experience, I know actually for sure, Paul experienced this in his life, trying to follow God and falling short. He says, uh, even at the end of chapter 7, he says, and he, sa- he summarizes the problem this way. He says, so then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law. I want to do what's right. I want to follow God's. But in my flesh, I'm a slave to the law of sin. So he says, this is the problem. I want to follow God. I want to do what's right. In my mind, I want to serve God. I want to follow his law. But the problem is, in my flesh, I'm a slave to the law of sin. And this leads Paul to say at the end of Romans 7, and it leads him to say, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body that's subject to death? And for any of us who are trying to follow Jesus on our own and have experienced our inability to do so, I hope that this is where all of us come to. All of us need to come to this point of saying, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? But here's the beautiful thing. Paul may have struggled like this. Paul struggled like we do. But he found the answer. He found the way out. He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body that's subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he goes on in beautiful Romans chapter 8. And he says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And just in case you missed that, I want to read what he said in Romans 7, just real quick again. This is what he said was the problem. He said, So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law. But here's the problem. But in my flesh, a slave to the law of sin. But look at the answer in Romans 8. He says, Through Christ Jesus, the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin. Do you see that? He says, hey, the problem, Romans 7, I can't follow God. It's because I'm a slave to this law of sin. Romans 8, he goes, but look, now the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ has set you free from the law of sin. And he goes on to say, for what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Here is my point, is that there is many of us who feel like I can't do it. I can't do this. I can't follow Jesus. Following Jesus is too hard. Or maybe just this little piece of following Jesus. I can't stop looking at porn, and I'm pretty sure I can't do it. I can't put down the bottle. I can't stop going off at my coworkers. I can't be a good father. I can't be a good friend. Whatever it is, we think I can't do it. But the answer to I can't do it is the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, you can, is what Paul's trying to get at. He says, you no longer walk in the flesh. What that means is you're no longer just doing it on your own. On your own, you can't do it. That's right. But you're not on your own anymore. You have the Holy Spirit who will help you to complete your enormous task of following Jesus. And maybe your thing isn't a big sin issue. Maybe you're just not happy. Maybe you have no peace. Maybe you just don't have that joy of the Lord, which the Bible says is our strength. If that's where you are, that's not where God intended you to be. In, Rome, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul says, he's talking about uh, all these acts of the flesh, and he says, hey, this is what happens. This is what happens when you're walking in the flesh. This is what happens when you're just doing this all on your own, out of your own strength. He says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauch- debauchery, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, and the list goes on and on and on. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He's saying if you're walking in the flesh, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get sexual morality and selfish ambition and envy. But if you're walking in the Spirit, you get love and joy and peace. And he said, what's, what's the issue? What do you have to do? He says it so simple in verse 16. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He makes it sound that simple. He says, this is your problem. You don't need to try harder. You don't need to practice. There's no homework from this sermon to do. All there is, is walk in the Spirit. It's, it's a little bit frustratingly simple, actually, with all the studying that we do and, and all of the, all the work we do and trying to figure out, you know, how are we supposed to live this Christian life? And those studies are important and we do need to study our Bible. Uh, but sometimes it's so simple. It's, Holy Spirit. He is what we need. The Holy Spirit is the answer. He, ge- he is the one who's going to give us joy. He's the one who's going to give us peace. He's the one who's going to help us to live righteously. He's the one who's going to help us complete our mission of following Jesus, of being witnesses to the ends of the earth. <sighs> the people that I'm talking to right now is anybody who's experienced trying to follow Jesus, but it just feels like it's way too hard. I think I've made that clear. I'm talking about you feel like you're out in an ocean and you're just trying to get to the other side, but all you have is a paddle. You got an oar and you're just trying your hardest to get to cross the ocean with just this boat and this oar and it feels impossible. The Holy Spirit is to us sails. He's the one You lift up the sails, you put down the oar, and the wind, it just takes you. And all you have to do is to make sure to keep your sail up. this This is what we're talking about. The Holy Spirit is meant to empower us. We're not supposed to conjure up the power and conjure up the, we're not supposed to grit our fists and just kind of work your hardest at doing this Christian life. That's never what it was meant to be. That's, that's called religion. Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and Christians who try to live without the Holy Spirit, this is, this is the experience of religion. I'm going to try my hardest, and I'm going to do this for God. But true Christianity is following Jesus, not out of your own strength, but relying on the Holy Spirit to take you and empower you and push you and guide you. If following Jesus is hard to you right now, hear me, your answer is the Holy Spirit, more of the Holy Spirit. I want to read to you uh, a really cool story. I'm going to try to be brief with it. Uh, But one of my favorite people that I've been reading about recently is a guy named D.L. Moody. And D.L. Moody was an evangelist in the the late 19th century. And he was just on fire for Jesus. He was converted whenever he moved to Chicago uh, as as a young man. And he real quick just got real passionate about serving the Lord. He was real big into um, children's ministry and the YMCA, back when the YMCA was like a really, really Christian thing. And that was what he was all about. Uh, but he was, and, and he got bigger and bigger. Uh, hit, people got to get to know him, and he went around traveling and speaking and stuff. Uh, but the problem was, is that he was burning himself out. He was going uh, 100 miles an hour, 24-7, and uh, he describes it as, you know, he was heading towards spiritual and physical and uh, mental collapse. And so uh, just I want to read what, what changed in his life, uh, what happened because of that. Um, <clears throat> he talks about his need right here. It says, signs appeared showing that, Dio- that Dwight Moody was on a guilt-ridden and work-laden pathway towards emotional and spiritual collapse. Exhausted, yet plagued by a constant feeling of never doing enough for his family, he was even more burdened by a sense of never pleasing God because he could not meet the massive needs he observed everywhere he turned. Looking back on this time, Moody admitted that in my work I was quite discouraged and I was ready to hang my harp on the willow. Sometimes he would find temporary solace in a Bible story. Noah, after all, did not get discouraged and quit, but guilt and anxiety inevitably reappeared. They were constant companions he could not elude. And so uh, he was on the edge of just burnout right here for a long time. And this was until a woman named Sarah Cook 
moved to Chicago. And uh, she was a, a woman of God, and she was looking when she first got to Chicago of where she could uh, come and start working for the Lord. And so uh, she found the YMCA where Mr. Moody was hanging out and doing his ministry. And it says, uh, this is what she said, The first place I found was the YMCA. Mr. Moody was an active worker there, a diamond in the rough, most truly, with the desire to do good, burning through everything, his earnestness moving people. But with all such a lack in his teachings of the divine unction and power, you see, she saw something in, in, in D.L. Moody. She says, he's a good man, he's trying really hard, he's doing a lot of work for the Lord, but he's lacking that special thing. He's lacking that secret sauce. He's lacking that special power. If we were put it in our superhero terminology, he was lacking that secret weapon. And so it uh, goes on, and um, what happened was uh, Sarah Cook got with another, another woman, uh, one of her prayer partners, and they started praying for D.L. Moody. They started praying that he would receive, uh, that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit in, this, in a greater measure. And uh, they would come to these YMCA meetings where he would preach, and after every meeting, they would come up to him, and they would be like, Mr. Moody, we're praying for you. And at first, he'd be like, okay, thanks. And, but they would keep on coming, they would keep on coming, and they would keep saying, we're praying for you, we're praying for you. And finally, he got a little irritated with them, and he turned around finally one time, and he was like, why are you praying for me? Stop praying for me. Pray for the lost people. And they turned, and they looked at him, and they said, Mr. Moody, we're praying that you would receive the power. And they talked a little bit after this, and, and Moody not only were they praying for him anymore, uh, he was praying with them for him. And they would get together every Friday and then have a prayer meeting that he would receive this greater measure of the Holy Spirit that he was talking about, that they were, that they were talking about. And, and at the time, he's still burnt out. He's still uh, trying and doing all this stuff on his own. He's ready to hang up and just quit. Uh, and he, he just knows that he needs something. And so they keep on praying and, and praying and praying. And uh, weeks go by. And finally... One day, Moody was walking down the streets in New York, and, he just, and he, uh, the experience is described this way. It says, I, would cr I was crying out that God would fill me with his spirit. Moody was so burned out that nothing else really mattered. He said, it did not seem as if there was any unction resting on my ministry. He had endured almost four months of intense spiritual agony. Moody says, God seemed to be just showing me myself. I found I was ambitious. I was not preaching for Christ. I was preaching for ambition. I found everything in my heart was not, ought to wear, ought, was not that it ought to be there. For four months, a wrestling went on within me. I was a miserable man. But suddenly, after four months, the anointing came. It came upon me as I was walking in the streets of New York. The Holy Spirit came upon Moody in great force while he was walking down Wall Street. All of a sudden, nothing was important except to be alone with the Lord. He went as fast as he could to the residence of a New York friend and asked for a room to pray in. And he describes it this way. What a day. I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it. It is almost too sacred an experience to name. Paul had an experience on which he never spoke for 14 years. I can only say God revealed himself to me. And I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. Now, Moody says that something happened right there that day. He had been praying for the Holy Spirit nonstop. And for him, the Holy Spirit came and touched him in such a way that he had to go into a room, and there was some indescribable experience where the Holy Spirit came on him um, and that it changed his life. I want to just make a caveat here. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes on people in many different ways, but the point is, is that we need him. The point is, is that when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, when we're filled afresh with the Holy Spirit, things change. Something happens. Discouraged people become encouraged. Weak people become empowered. We get whatever it is that we're lacking that we needed to follow Jesus. It all comes with the Holy Spirit. 
and look at uh, what his friends said about him years later. This was the fruit of that event. This is what changed in his life because of the Holy Spirit coming upon him in that way. It said, D.L. Moody's experience with the Holy Spirit in 1871 left him profoundly changed. Inner peace, disappearance of spiritual depression, focused goals, a calmer demeanor, and preaching with new power characterized the man. If the changes were not apparent to Moody himself and to his friends and to the closest people on a daily basis, people who saw him after lengthy separations noticed appreciable differences. They said that he, he observed great divine energy. A self-generated energy manifested in hustling to and fro disappeared. In its place, they noticed a spirit-led, purposeful march along a pathway that was soon crowded with changed lives. I don't know about you, but I want that. I want to see, I want to look back behind me years from now and see a wake of changed lives. And I know, and I've tried hard enough on my own long enough, that that will not happen by me just gritting my teeth and white knuckling it to where people are just going to come follow Jesus because of me. I know that the only way I can do it is the same way the disciples did it is through the Holy Spirit coming and filling me. And that's how it's going to happen for all of us, is the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus told the disciples to wait. They could not do it without this Holy Spirit. So what do we do now? What's the application? What's the take home from this sermon? I hope I made it clear right now that we can't do this on our own and we need something, a power greater than ourselves. And that is the Holy Spirit. Well, I think the answer lies in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 9. He says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We're encouraged, we are commanded to ask, to plead for the Holy Spirit. And I just want to, I know I'm going long on time here, but I have to make this point because I know that there's some people thinking it is, I'm a Christian, I have the Holy Spirit, why would I ask for something that I already have? And that's true. If you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, the beautiful news is that you do have the Holy Spirit, and you are sealed even with the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that he is a, uh, the Greek is arabon, which means a down payment. He's a deposit. He's a seal that God's going to complete that work in you, and that you will be fully saved, and you'll be glorified. So yes, you do have the Holy Spirit, Christian. But there's this crazy thing where Paul tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We are to ask for more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us in measure. The Bible says not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Uh, just for, as an, for an example, if you remember my talk a couple weeks ago, the Jesus came to the disciples, he appeared to them, and he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And there they received the Holy Spirit. But now, just a few days later than that, Jesus is talking to them, and he's saying, wait for the Holy Spirit. We can have the Holy Spirit, but not be full of the Holy Spirit. What we need is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Philip's, um, I forget his name. Um, I'm going to tell Michael, and he's going to put it down here on the bottom in post, and he's going to find the guy's name and probably the correct quote if I butcher it. But he says, do not pray for easy tasks. Or he sa uh, sorry, he said, do not pray for tasks that meet your power. Pray for power that meets the task. Brothers and sisters, we've been given the great task of being witnesses of Jesus to the ends of the earth. We've been given the great task of being godly men and women. We've been, the great, been given the great task of following Jesus. And it's not something small enough that we can do it on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. We need more of him. <laughs> Heavenly Father,
Heavenly Father, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit. God, I pray that you would give us more of your divine empowerment. I pray that you would give us more of you, God. You've given us a great, amazing, even impossible mission that we won't be able to fulfill on our own. And so we're here and we beg you, we ask you, fill us more with your spirit. Give us more of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you. We thank you for hearing us. And we thank you that as we ask that you're a good father and that you will give us more of your Holy Spirit. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on. And to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I will lift my eyes in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives. And I will walk with you, knowing you'll see me through, and sing the songs you give. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King. And it makes my heart, how can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough, how amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart, I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. Thanks very much for being with us today, and we hope that you have a blessed week walking with the Lord. You know, right now, a number of you are going to partake of the Lord's Supper, and we hope that you'll receive that gift of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus with joy this morning. I want to read, say another prayer that I have said uh, with my family around the Lord's Supper time during quarantine. And uh, this will also serve just as a closing prayer and a transition into the Lord's Supper for us. So pray with me now, please. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours utterly dedicated to you. And then use us, we pray, as you will. And always to your glory and the welfare of your people. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.